Greetings AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and video number one from our newest topic 6.12 which is all about a new integration technique for BC called partial fraction decomposition integration. And our focus in this video is going to be a pretty basic type of entry question where you're only going to have the, the distinct linear factors and we'll talk about all the different kinds of factors that are going to come into play. So what does all this mean? What is a partial fraction? What is a linear factor? Well a lot of this is going to kind of take you back to your days from maybe a pre-calculus class, maybe a college algebra 2 class, and we're going to talk about some algebra here. So linear factors. Well in this section it says you're going to see a method for rewriting certain rational functions that is very useful in integration. So basically I want you to think about this. Think about having um, a situation where you have two fractions, very algebraic fractions, that you have to say either add or subtract. Well we know that we can't do that until we get a common denominator and in this particular case this common denominator x plus 2 x minus 5 seems to fit the bill and if we do the algebra correctly and we multiply the top and the bottom by the appropriate fractions then we would end up producing a new fraction with the common denominator simplify it and we find that we have this expression here in green at that right side that's going to match that expression that's in yellow on the left side. They're the same thing. They're equivalent to each other. So what does this have to do with calculus? What does this have to do with integration? Well let's just say that the thing that's in green is what you had to integrate. Well you can see down in the next line that's what's going on. I'm trying to integrate that thing in green and that's a pretty tricky thing to integrate. It doesn't quite follow the rules that we've talked about already. It doesn't fit into any pattern that we've discussed so far. So what we need to do is split this apart into two separate fractions that can be integrated. And as you can see, that is what has happened when this split apart into that yellow, which we knew was equivalent to the green. So the grand question is, how do we move backwards? How do you undo the common denominator and move backwards? And that's what partial fraction decomposition is all about. So some vocabulary terms. The individual fractions that we've indicated here are called partial fractions. And we will always set them up a very, very similar process according to this blue box. So for instance, if, if we have a situation on hand where we have linear factors, now linear factors are defined by an x raised to the first power. And I know these variables with these subscripts are very intimidating. I don't want you to worry about that for right now. All I want you to focus on is that the denominators both have x to the first. And if that were to happen, then you can break this apart into your partial fractions and know that the numerators are just going to consist of the constants a and b. And our general way that we present these in calculus are with capital letters, a, capital letter b. Okay. Now I know that that's a little fuzzy still. It's like, okay, I don't quite see how this fits together, especially if you've forgotten a lot about partial fractions. And let's face it, a lot of kids who go into Calculus BC forget the partial fractions. So we're going to review it. So for our first example, we're going to integrate 1 over x squared plus x minus 2. Let's forget that this is a calculus problem, just for the time being. And let's just work the partial fractions 1 over x squared plus x minus 2. What can we do with that? Well, what we can do with that is, first of all, factor the denominator. And that's one thing that you know that's going to happen with a partial fraction problem. Because if you cannot factor the denominator, then it's likely not going to be a partial fraction decomposition. So there's going to be your factoring. Clean that up a bit. And then we're going to go ahead and break this apart. Well, according to our model, we know that this would be equivalent to some constant a over one of the two factors. It does not matter which one you put first, plus some value, some constant b over our other denominator factor x minus 1. OK, well, what do we do then? Well, from this point, we're going to 
clear away everything. We want to multiply everything by the common denominator. So I'm going to make that note right here. We want to multiply everything by the common denominator, which in this case is going to be the x plus 2 times x minus 1. Now what that will give us is 1 equivalent to a times x minus 1 plus b times x plus 2. Now let's let the dust settle there a little bit. You're maybe like, likely writing this down. Hopefully you are if you're my students. And we're going to think about what just transpired here. Well, we multiplied the left side by both of those denominators, canceling them away. And then as we moved through the right side, we saw just some partial cancellations. We still see the x minus 1 hanging around with the a and the x plus 2 hanging around with the b. The next step, we're going to use a very special method. It's called the Heaviside method. It's named after a mathematician, and it's going to allow us to find the value for a and b. So just what is this Heaviside method? What we're going to do is choose a very opportunistic value of x that's going to wipe away one of these terms, whether it's the a term or b term. So we notice that a very legitimate x that could make that happen would be 1. So let's let x equal 1. If we do that, throughout the problem we get 1 equal a times 0, of course, plus b times 3. And notice the a is wiped away, and you are now able to solve for b. And b is going to be 1 third. That worked <clears throat> so well. I would like to do it again. Let's pick another opportunistic value for x that might help us solve for a. And we're going to choose x to be negative 2 in this case, because that's going to wipe away this b value. And we see we have a, a 1 equals a times negative 3, plus, of course, b times 0. And then once we solve everything out, a is equal to negative 1 third. Now, it is just a coincidence that a and b are the same values with opposite signs because that's not always going to be the case. Okay. Also, it goes maybe without saying that once you found this b, you honestly could have used any value in the world for x. It would not have had to have been negative 2 because once you know b, you could use it throughout the rest of the solution. But it's certainly a lot quicker to use negative 2 so that it wipes out that particular b value to find a a lot quicker. So at that point, the algebra is over, and now the calculus can begin again. So what do I mean by that? Well, for the calculus, we're going to rewrite this integral, that problem that we're trying to solve, the integration of 1 over x squared plus x minus 2 with respect to x. This problem is equivalent to the integration of a over x plus 2, which would be negative one-third, and I'll tell you what, let's put that negative one-third on top. I'd like to write that just a bit differently. So there's our a over x plus 2, and then I'll add my b over x plus 2. And give you guys a chance there to kind of catch up. What we have looks a little ugly. There's no question about that. But one thing is for certain, it's really not very difficult to integrate. You just have to know your log rule. Realize that we have a constant negative one-third that could plop out to the front with natural log of the absolute value of x plus 2, right? You're just basically integrating a 1 over u. And if you let u be x plus 2, it's all good because it's not going to be very confusing because the derivative of that is 1. Now, I just noticed I made a mistake. I'm going to fix that before we go any further, so I apologize. Sometimes when you write and talk at the same time, bad things happen. That denominator should be an x minus 1. So make sure that you correct that before you go any further. It's coming from this particular fraction. All right, we're going to go ahead and drop our plus, put down our constant 1 third. When we integrate 1 over x minus 1, that's the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1, and then we can put our plus c in. 
There's absolutely nothing wrong with that answer. I would accept that answer. It's very possible on a multiple choice there could be some variation of this particular answer. And I tell you what I'd like to do is go ahead and move over to the calculator to check it and see what other ways this answer could be presented. So here we are with our graphing calculator program. Let's go ahead and throw in our shortcut for the derivative, or integral, sorry. Get rid of those boundaries and throw in our fraction 1 over x squared plus x minus 2 with respect to x. And what we see for our answer is, well, that looks just a little bit different. That looks not quite what we had. So let's move back into the document and compare our answers. Now back at the document, I've actually taken a screenshot of our calculator and I've played that there just below the camera. And you can see that we don't quite look the same but we could probably manipulate this just a little bit. Now I'm going to do this very, very oh, methodically to kind of show you what's happening and maybe get us a better feel of that, about what's happening. So what we've got here is a situation where I could conceivably uh, rethink the order here. Maybe I put the natural log absolute value of x minus 1 first with its one-third coefficient, which means I'll subtract one-third natural log of absolute value of x plus 2. And then, of course, the plus c. Well, I could factor out a one-third, at which point I could then divide the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1 divided by the absolute value of x plus 2. And then we have our plus C. And I'm going to be honest with you, this is probably a little bit more of a reasonable answer that I would consider, but if you notice our calculator just wants to do something a bit different. They decided to flip the order of the natural log, which essentially means that it's reciprocated, which essentially means that it has a negative one exponent, which means that negative could fly in the front and hence, that's why we have a negative in front of that natural log. So to be honest, I would say that the answer that I have written here would be the most reduced version that could potentially show up as a multiple choice answer. But it's a way for you to kind of keep on your toes if you decide to use graphing calculator technology to uh, find these answers. Again, the answer that we got either here or here are perfectly acceptable in a free response question, though. Anyway, I hope this helps kind of give you a bit of an introduction and, and remind you about these uh, partial fraction techniques. Uh, they don't really get a whole lot harder. They build just a little bit. And uh, we're going to take a look at a different style of partial fraction decomp problem in our next video. So be sure to check it out. Thanks.